Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the webinar series for the International Social Capital Association. Our webinar series has been running for a couple of years now and so far we've hosted over 50 webinars on social capital by invited speakers from, from about 15 different countries spanning every continent. And we've had over 4,000 people attend our webinars from at least 136 different countries. Now today we have our first invited speaker from my home country, New Zealand. In this session, we welcome Professor Sally Davenport for a presentation and discussion about social capital ideas and building a mission-led research program. Sally Davenport is a professor of management at Wellington School of Business and Government and former commissioner of the New Zealand Productivity Commission. Sally's academic life began as a research chemist with research interests covering the commercialization of scientific research, entrepreneurship, and the growth of high-tech firms, innovation, strategy, and policy. Sally has led research grants covering projects on competitive advantage in New Zealand firms and sustainability and firm level productivity in our biotechnology and food and beverage sectors. Sally is also an adjunct professor of the College of Business and Economics at the Australian National University, a fellow of the International Society for Professional Innovation and Management, and a member of the New Zealand Institute of Directors and a member of Global Women. Welcome, Sally, and over to you. Thank you very much, Tristan, and tēnā koutou katoa to the audience here. Um, Tristan has mentioned that uh, we have quite a lot of New Zealanders on the audience today, which is which is really great and very delighted. But also just to, um, a little caveat for the New Zealanders in the audience, because this is also quite an international audience, um, I might end up explaining some of the context uh, in New Zealand a bit more than you might expect to hear in a, in a normal um, talk on New Zealand, the New Zealand system, just to make sure that everybody has a, a good idea about what I'm talking about, I hope. So I'm, I'm currently director of something called the um, Science for Technological Innovation National Science Challenge, uh, called SIFTI for short, and um, which I'll introduce you to a bit more in depth later, but it's one of 11 um, mission-led research programs in New Zealand called National Science Challenges that were set up uh, about, well, started in 2014, um, but we all started at different times. So we've been going for about six years. Um, I became very interested in, in what this what mission-led meant and um, came across the work of, of Mariana Mazzucato, who talks a lot about um, sort of moonshot type ideas for trying to address uh, more serious challenges. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, her work as sort of underpinning some of the things that we've been doing and also uh, how some of those things might sort of um, diffuse, if you like, to other types of, of research programs. Um, this shot I've got here, the New Zealanders will recognise, is actually of a New Zealand company called Rocket Lab, which uh, for those of you who um, don't know, is this is actually probably one of the most second, um, most prolific rocket launching um, organisations in the world, and so um, it's, it's, so New Zealand has its own space agency as well as its own um, rocket um, launching site and, and company that builds them. So, um, so we have our own moonshot program, if you like, a real moonshot program um, in New Zealand. So, so what the thing about mission-led research programs um, that I'm very interested in is, is sort of how do you build a multidisciplinary team that is um, broader than uh, and the normal sorts of teams we often end up funding in the New Zealand or in other elsewhere systems in terms of teams that tend to already know each other. How do you, how do you build new teams? And I'm very interested in, uh, well, have been very interested in social capital ideas and thought that actually framing some of the work that we're doing, thinking, using the sort of social capital um, framework of sort of structural, relational and cognitive social capital, um, it provides quite a bit of insight, I think, into some of the reasons why I think um, some of our processes have, have been very successful. We, we've had those that I haven't always worked, but I think it does provide an interesting lens uh, on what we've been doing. So over those gosh, 30 years now that I have been working more as an innovation researcher after shifting into a business school after my chemistry career, um, it became very clear to me that um, you know the essential role of collaboration in so many spheres of our lives, actually, which we, we saw a lot in the Productivity Commission work as well, but particularly in um, research projects where you're trying to have a bit more impact um, in, in addition to generating um, new knowledge. So 
it's all very easy and you know I'm, I'm not saying anything that's that's anything new to you a collaboration is a word that has been uh, is often um, bandied around with with projects of all sorts but just saying you've got to collaborate um, is not exactly very helpful so I've spent the last um, yes 30 years probably in various um, perspectives on collaboration in you know within high-tech firms with between researchers and organizations um, and so that's why I'm, I'm speaking to you today I guess so one of the things that um, being from New Zealand um, makes it very interesting from a collaboration point of view is, is the notion of proximity. Um, and this is one thing that I have um, spoken about before and written a little bit about as well, is that there's often an, um, a presumption and it's in the social capital literature as well, that um, you know, distance or, or closeness, um, geographic proximity is actually the most important um, for collaboration. Um, I'm not entirely a great fan of that. Um, just while I've got that shot on here, sometimes being geographically distant like we are in New Zealand um, is quite useful because that's a shot of um, a rocket lab launching out into the South Pacific Ocean where there are very little ships, let alone land. So being geographically distant has actually been very helpful um, for that particular company. So the framework that I like to think about with proximity, which is one that's from um, the paper by Boschman from 2005, is that it has sort of five approaches to thinking about proximity. And those of you who are social capital protagonists will notice that there's quite a lot of overlap with that, that um, social capital framework using cognitive, relational, and um, structural proximity. So I really like these thinking a bit more differently. So cognitive, obviously, in terms of the sorts of shared values, shared norms, shared language that um, we talk about a lot in the social capital area. Organizational proximity, are we a similar sort of organization or are we different? Um, social proximity in terms of are we in a sort of a, a similar grouping? Do we understand each other's um, sort of, again, those sort of norms and, and ways of operating? Institutional proximity, do we work in the same sort of regulatory framework, same sort of um, settings in terms of how we have to operate? And then, of course, geographic proximity. Um, so I haven't, I'm not going to talk so much more about them today, but I think for social capital people, the notion of proximity is something that is really worth thinking of a little more carefully and also particularly because of its overlap with a lot of social capital notions. So the reason I'm talking to you today is because Tristan came across this paper of mine and my colleague, Or Stalenbach, who also actually works with me inside the National Science Challenge, uh, which is a, a paper that um, came after um, a wonderful project that Orson and I did um, in the early 2000s, um, looking at what was then called um, a center of research excellence. They were a new type of organization that the New Zealand government uh, put together. Um, so they were the first sort of pan, major pan research centers in New Zealand. And I was lucky enough to know um, one of the directors, well, the director of one called um, the McDiarmid Institute, um, Sir Paul Callaghan, I, my PhD is in a similar area from his, his, and he was really interested in how he was setting up the centre, and he, he recognised that he was quite a visionary, he recognised that it was a new type of collaborative organisation, and that it would be really useful to actually perhaps understand a little bit more about what they were doing and, and why it was, was or wasn't working. So in 2004, um, Orson and I went in and we uh, interviewed all 45 were then principal investigators, as well as collected a whole, we were given amazing access to all sorts of data um, about the Institute, including, you know, being sitting in on board meetings, having all the email conversations and all those sorts of things. So it was, um, was it's, there was no bricks and mortar with this research centre. It had a director, um, Sir Paul Callaghan in, um, from Wellington, and then it had a deputy director, Richard Blakey, who some of you will know, who's, um, who was then at Canterbury University. So those are sort of the nodes, if you like, of, of this new centre. So we, we wanted to know a bit more about, with the, something that's so virtual, and this is, you know, this is several decades ago now, so that even some of the IT systems were pretty basic at that stage, there's no Zoom or anything like that. Um, how do you make people feel that they would belong to something like this? How do you coordinate that sort of activity? activity inside a research centre. So this was the paper that resulted, so that's in the British Journal of Management that came out finally in 2011 after a lot of revises and resubmits as people will uh, know that, that system. Um, and this is sort of one of the things that, that we, we use the social capital lens to look at some of the data we had. And this is one of the things that really struck me um, 
right from the beginning. So this is something that Orst did. We did a bibliometric analysis of just only two years worth, or two years worth of publications, three years apart. Now the centre was started in 2002 and, and knowing the longevity that it takes to get a paper published, the 2002 um, papers could be thought of as what was happening before the Institute got going. And the 2004, a little bit uh, later. And we also looked at um, just the notion of proximity. So how, how did people feel they were, were close or not to this organisation? So that's what the, the squares and dots on the left are. Those are the unconnected, at that stage in 2002, the people who were not, had not co-published with anybody else in the Institute at that time. The um, red dots are the ones who felt that they were quite close to the organisation. The, um, no, there's the clear dots, sorry, circles are the ones who felt quite close to the organisation, the red ones are the ones who were, who are a bit more peripheral. And you'll notice that even over the, the, the density of networks got um, more intricate in the 2004 publications, but also the number of people who were actually brought into the network, into the publishing network, was um, increased, particularly from that group who felt that they did um, feel quite close to the organisation. So we used um, uh, a, a, another um, framework that from some other publication from other publishers who had talked about four different organisations that where people felt they strongly identified but were distant, strongly identified but were close, didn't identify with the organisation, were distant and close. So they had four different organisations. And what we realised when we were looking at our data was that in actual fact, we had within one organization, people that fitted into all four of these categories. So for identification, what I mean here is, do you feel like you belong to this organization? Do you really identify with what it's trying to do and its values? And then we've got our physical proximity and um, as the other measure. And you can see there that we've got, you know, what you would expect, we've got eight of the 45 people were, who were physically distant also felt they didn't really belong and 17 of 45 were close and close. But we also had the off diagonals as well, which is really interesting. So we had 14 people who were quite physically distant, some of them often one person in their institution belonging to the Institute, but actually felt very close to the organization. And ditto for the people who are across the corridor from the director, but didn't feel very strongly about belonging to the organization. So a really interesting set of data to play with. So also I um, then went and looked at a lot of other characteristics. Um, so we were um, particularly for using that social capital lens. So we looked at things like um, the disciplinary background. Um, did they run a piece of equipment? Were they um, involved in the executive? Did they have any other um, like theme lead responsibilities? What, what are the other aspects of their role in the um, Institute? that could make, could have a different uh, look at it. And then used in the paper, we use the social capital notions to look at what might explain some of that. Um, one of my favorite, I'm not gonna go into the paper in too much more detail because it's, it's there and you can read it. And actually uh, the interesting thing about that paper is that um, its citations have peaked last year. So I think it's one of those papers that because it's dealing with virtual organizations in a, in a pandemic, um, perhaps people have, have suddenly realized that maybe we need to know a bit more about organizing in these sorts of um, institutions. I just before I finish though, this is one of my most favorite pieces of qualitative data ever. And I think it really captures the sort of the cognitive social capital that um, you know, we, we sometimes look for. It's probably one of the hardest ones to actually measure if you like or, or assess. And uh, but I think this um, chap gave me you know, the most wonderful quote about the fact that belonging is more psychology than reality. It's like, how do you belong to a football club? So, um, but, but things happen. So that it does actually mean something. It's not just something that is um, in your mind. It actually, things appear, students appear, equipment appears. So it's belonging to an idea. And I think I really love this quote. And so um, I had to get it into the presentation today. All right, so that gives you a bit of background about how um, my thinking about social capital um, led me to start thinking about that a bit more when I became the director of, of this National Science Challenge. So the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to um, uh, speak a little bit firstly about the context for um, mission-led research um, in New Zealand, um, and particularly our context. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we've done inside SIFTI, so that's Science for Technological Innovation, um, and with how 
and, and trying to bring that social capital lens onto what we're doing and, and why we've done it and why we think some of these things are, seem to be working quite nicely. Okay, so what I was particularly interested in when trying to think about, I mean, I wasn't the first director of SIFTI, I should say that. There was um, Margaret Highland, who's now the DVC research at, at Victoria, was the first director for a year, but I was involved in the research um, program. So even before I became director, I was really interested in how do you get collaboration when in most of our research systems, everything inside them just works against collaboration. What we, we make people compete for huge, you know, spend huge amounts of time competing for small amounts of money, um, particularly, and I'm, I'm sure that's probably common in a lot of places. So how do you get around that intensely competitive notion when you want everything else in the literature would say you want collaboration to get the sort of best people working on a, pro on a problem. So, as I mentioned, um, we're quite interested in the work of Mariana Mazzucato. We actually came across her a couple of years after we started. So some of the work we did intuitively without having this notion of a mission-led approach. Um, but her work has, is getting a lot of traction internationally. Um, in the last few years, uh, it started with a book called um, The Entrepreneurial State, which is where a lot of the ideas around um, the role of government, particularly in the original um, moonshot program in the US and how important they were to orchestrating, if you like, some of the um, research that then spins off into the um, private sector. And so with some of our more complex challenges, particularly the sustainable development goals, she's been working with a lot of nations around the world to think about um, why and how you get some of these mission-led approaches in. Um, what I like to think is that she's very much still um, concentrating on the quite high level work at the moment, and but the, some of the examples around how are still coming out. So and I'd like to think that in a small micro way, we're only one type of mission type approach. Um, SIFTI has actually experimented with some things about the how that you do these, you get these mission led approaches working. So she, for example, I'm not going to go through all the things on the left, she talks about um, the role of mission selection, about co-production, which we tend to call co-design, um, the various things that you might need to have in, in these sorts of programs. And one of the things that she does talk about increasingly in recent years um, is the role of collaboration. And again, I think there's a lot more um, nuance to be put around that, but it's becoming very clear that how do you support these sorts of massive approaches to our big grand challenges um, in collaboration, but the collaboration is between people who've never worked before, I don't speak the same language, that sort of thing. So very strongly um, aligned with the sort of social capital um, ideas. So yes, as I said, um, there's all sorts of more work coming out. So her institute is called the um, Institute for Innovation and, and Public Purpose, I think, if I get it right. So um, there's a lot of material on her website if you're interested in this sort of area. Um, she has a big team in there writing around these sorts of things. So one of the recent typologies that they presented showed some of the different approaches to, to implementing missions. And I, I would put the SIFTI and the other National Science Challenges into the sort of portfolio-led, um, purpose-driven um, science, technology, innovation institutions and research-led missions. So we're, we're not just the only type of mission-led approach. There are others as well. Oops. Okay, so into, back into the New Zealand scene. Uh, so the National Science Challenges were set up originally um, in 2014. They were actually crowdsourced from the whole of the New Zealand um, population to say what things should we be working on in New Zealand specific to our particular challenges. So I like to think that this is quite an, an early approach to trying to do some of this. It was led by our then um, Chief Science, Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, Sir Peter Glockman. Uh, and so naturally, of course, coming from New Zealand, there were a lot of, lot of interest in a sort of environmental type of challenges, as well as our health challenges. One of the things that didn't come out of the crowdsourcing was anything around sort of engineering and the physical sciences. So in actual fact, SIFTI was a bit of an add-on, if you like, to the other science challenges. So those are the 11 of them. We are, we are all 10-year programs, and we're all, unfortunately, due to finish in the middle of 2024. But we've all done some quite interesting and novel things, which we hope to capture um, in the next couple of years. Because I mean, I always said this would make a fabulous PhD project. Actually, you've got 11 brand new organizations, all of them virtual, 
that have been set up at exactly the same time and the same sort of institutional conditions, but we've all experimented in quite different ways. And so I'm, I'm very much, as I say, hoping to capture some of that diversity um, before we all finish. So each um, National Science Challenge was given a mission. Uh, and our mission was to enhance the capacity of New Zealand to use physical sciences for en and engineering for economic growth. And we would also add for well-being because a lot of this is about implementing it in society, not just about generating commercial income. Now, the important words in there are actually enhancing the capacity uh, because that's when we actually first put in our first proposal, the, the um, panel that was assessing all the national science applications actually pushed back and said, this is just about the technical stuff. What are you, what are you, how are you thinking about enhancing the capacity? We're not just interested in the research, we want to know what you mean about capacity. And so we went back to the um, drawing board and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But when the other, before we get to that enhancing capacity bit, one of the, just to, um, to talk a little bit about our themes, so unlike some of the other challenges which are in an environment area or in a health area, we like to think of ourselves as the, the tech for challenge. In, in other words, that we're a bit agnostic to sector. Uh, we want, like to work with the willing, which is a, a theme that Marina Casa um, talks about, that it's, it's not about picking winners, it's about working with the willing. So we have four themes. Um, Vision Mataronga, which for those people from, who are not from New Zealand, this is about enhancing the indigenous knowledge and capability and worldview of our Maori indigenous people in New Zealand. Uh, we have robotic sensors and automation, uh, um, data science and digital technologies, and um, materials manufacturing and technology and design. So you can see we're very broad. Um, very much right from sort of you know data right towards materials, robots as well. So there's there, it's a huge, you can't just point at one organization in New Zealand and say that's where these people would reside. There are engineers and data people across all of New Zealand. So just a little bit more about us. Um, Hiringa uh, Hangaro, Hiringa Tangata is, is our whakatauki, which is, uh, was gifted to us by a very well-known um, Māori academic, um, Supo Teramara. Um, so it really captures that benefit of the people aspect, so more than just economic growth. So it's a 10 year science program. We're one of the largest ones. So in that 10 years, um, we had an investment of 106 million to work with. Um, that might not sound much for some of the people from international um, realms, but from a, for a New Zealand research project, that's quite substantial. Uh, so far we've supported about 555 researchers. There's some more company ones coming on at the moment across 41 organizations. And then we have what, two different types of projects called spearhead projects, which are larger ones, got 11 of those, and 86 smaller seed projects, which I'll describe in a bit more detail because some of the processes that we've used for forming those um, projects are, are a little bit different. So in all of the research that we do, we talk about it being stretchy, so it has to sort of have originally a sort of 10 year horizon. More recently, we've come to more closer to impact, but also sticky. So sticky to New Zealand, there's a logic for doing it in New Zealand, either because of a particular environmental issue or a particular capability that we have here. So we have what we call um, a capacities model. So this is getting back to that, how do you enhance capacity? And um, we proposed in our original um, document that you know, currently, in particular in the research system, we very much focus on the technical capacity. And then if you're lucky and, and there's some good technical results, then you start thinking about how do you translate it into something that's implementable into industry or with, in our case, Māori partners. So we sort of reframed that a bit to say, actually, all of these capacities are equally important and they overlap. And, and for those of you with a social capital bent, you will see that we have augmented the technical with the sort of human skills. I'm not really that keen on the notion of soft skills, but the sort of human capability to think about understanding your stakeholders, understanding how your research is going to be implemented, and also that relational capacity. How do you build relationships with, with other researchers, but also more importantly, in terms of implementation with industry and Māori groups? So quite, they all overlap, obviously, they're not distinct. Um, but this is the model that's driven a lot of our thinking inside SIFTI. So we have a specific capacity development program, uh, which is um, 
which we have funded separately. And that's unusual in the research system. I mean, usually you assume that your capacity development is going to come from um, your organization. Hopefully they're going to be interested in your, your, your professional development and you, you would do it through that. But as a research program to have a separate capacity development fund over and above the technical fund is how I think we've been able to um, really think about building a, a holistic researcher, if you like, the sort of ideal researcher and going forward. But firstly, there's, uh, there's also some other capacity development. So what one of the things that we're really interested in apart from a collaboration point of view, again, that building social capital is how do we collaborate with people we don't really know very well and particularly for researchers don't always understand our stakeholders, our industry and our, our Māori and our other organizations. So we have these things called mission labs where we get together um, quite top level New Zealand Inc thinkers and we ask them, okay, where are the stretchy and sticky things that New Zealand should be doing? Um, so, for example, in this particular one, you'll see I'm using the example that came up, which was intelligent oceans. So how would you think about using the sort of technology that SIFTI could work on to improve how we, um, it's actually in the sort of aquaculture sector, it ended up being about um, how do we farm mussels out in the deep sea where they grow a lot more quickly using technology, but it's incredibly expensive to take a boat out to check your mussel ropes all the time. So how could we be smarter about that? Uh, we did, we also did things like, um, we, we used, set up and, and enabled a group of rangatahi, which just means young people up to sort of the age of 35 to have their own mission lab. So what did they want to see in the way of, of research projects? And that the woman in the middle there is actually one of our board members, Kat Lintot, who runs Wrestler, which is one of New Zealand's probably leading uh, virtual reality companies, and that's her daughter Willoughby. So we were trying to also think, okay, it's not just a traditional um, sort of senior wise heads that you look to for thinking about where do you get your missions from, we need to include a lot more diversity in, in those sorts of stakeholder things. So then we do what we call a mission co-design process. This is for our large projects. So we then, so we'll take Intelligent Oceans as an example. We then scope it out quite a bit. And, um, and then we, we do, we, we have the, the thing I would think, particularly from a social capital um, lens is interesting, is, is we are then, once we've explored the projects, how do we assemble a best team? And one of the things we decided to do right from the beginning was not just say, okay, everybody bid in your pet projects. Because this was about assembling one best team, not just funding lots of people's little projects, which is just contributing to that normal ultra competitive model. So we said, right, we're putting this much money on the table. And we put out what we call an expression of interest, but not an expression of interest for projects, it was an expression of interest for capability. So do you think you've got something you can bring to the table? In this case, it was for a clean water technology project. And that way, um, we're not prescribing who's coming to the, to the next meeting. So we, have, we then have what's called a, a mission co-design process where we facilitate with some of those stakeholders, industry and Māori still in the room, we facilitate a co-design workshop where the idea is we're going to have lo surface lots of ideas and then focus in on something that we could then form as a project. Now, the interesting thing from my point of view, as I think what now watching these, now that we've done quite a few of them, is that you end up with a much more diverse team. So for example, in the um, aquaculture project, we have not only do we have muscle experts, but we have software experts, we've got underwater communication experts, we've got underwater drone experts, we've got sensor experts. So they're from across a wide variety of disciplines, but also they don't necessarily have to have the huge track record to be involved. Yes, we've got some very experienced, um, very senior researchers in there, but we've also got some young emerging researchers who came up with some really good ideas and ways to contribute. So again, from a social capital lens, forming these best teams and these new relationships. The interesting thing, I think that we, we're gonna do a bit more work on this, but anecdotally, it seems that while the team, some of the teams that were more dense in terms of already knowing each other, got off the ground more quickly, whereas some of these new teams uh, that had to sort of do that sort of team formation process first and get to know each other, took a bit longer to get going, but boy, once they did, they, they'd taken off. So I'm hoping to actually do a bit more uh, research with us on that and see if we can actually um, maybe write another paper with a social capital lens about um, team formation in this sort of mission design process. 
All right, so just going back to our capacity development program. Uh, so we, we have a budget of about probably 600,000 a year. We don't always spend it every year, particularly in COVID times, um, to look at lots of different ways to um, enhance people's capacity. So there's direct capacity development inside our programs. And then there's also, we, we run our own courses. We work with other people in the ecosystem. For those New Zealanders, we particularly work very closely with KiwiNet, which is an organization that of um, a collaboration of most of the research institutes around trying to develop these sorts of skills as well. And, um, and we also let our researchers put their hand up and say, look, I really would like to increase my knowledge of vision matarana. So please, can I go on um, to a course to learn a little bit more about the Maori economy or something like that? So we're very open and flexible. And the idea is that um, if you become part of the SIFTI community, um, then there's a strong expectation that you would undertake some sort of capacity development. And in actual fact, at the moment, we've just got a draft document that's assessing um, sort of the, uh, a sort of an interim report on, on that process and how that's worked. And it's been very interesting to see who's picked up on the opportunity and run with it, because um, it, it is an unusual aspect for being part of a research um, program. We've done other things that you could also interpret as a, from a social capital lens. One of the things that's been particularly um, Beneficial, I think, is that we have made sure that at least one person from our leadership team, there are the leadership team of 10 of the New Zealand's most pretty highly regarded um, researchers in these areas, they mentor some of the early career researchers, particularly those smaller seed projects. And so this is uh, one young man who's gone on to be um, very successful in the robotics industry. Um, and so I think what we, what we do there is, is we've almost sort of created a bit of a Hawthorne effect. So those of you who have a management background might re recall that the, the Hawthorne effect comes from experiments that Harvard did years ago where um, they went into a factory and um, started observing the workers trying to understand how productivity might be increased. So they would turn the lights on, turn the lights off, put the heat up, put the heat down, etc. But what they found was no matter what they did, productivity increased anyway. And after some more investigation, realized that this is actually because these people were being observed, they felt very validated in their job and their role. And it sort of, so they were, felt that they more identified, if you like, belonged to the organization and, um, and therefore have worked a little harder. So I think this mentoring, having a senior academic interested in an early career researchers program, so they're checking up quarterly and things like that, um, really does. We, we have, do have that feedback that people really appreciate that someone's interested in their project. Um, we, we also have been extremely flexible, um, particularly around collaboration. We, we, um, uh, we, we introduced the notion that, you know, if your project doesn't look like it's going quite as you thought, that we would allow you to pivot. We actually used the word pivot before the um, pandemic came along. Um, and so we, we try to be as flexible as possible in our, in our contracting, um, and also, you know, where people are having trouble, um, we try and find, um, you know, the expertise for them to, to help with their project. We have our own commercialization development manager who also works pretty closely. So I think being flexible and open, I think, also is, I think, helping collaboration because from a social capital lens, um, people are not afraid to come and talk to us if they're having an issue. So it's building that relational capital, if you like, um, in, this, in our community. Uh, we also put a strong emphasis on building community. It's been a little bit more virtual in the last couple of years, but this is our All of Researcher workshop where we get several hundred of our researchers together in the room. But it's not a scientific workshop. It is about building their relational and human capacity. So we do all sorts of things, have speakers, have exercises, have um, all sorts of um, collaborative work where the community is working together and remembering that a lot of these people don't know each other at all. Um, and, and do um, things. And we, we know from our um, sort of feedback that everybody really appreciates this. And also that several other projects have spun out of the, the sort of the, the social times that we all know are so important at these sorts of workshops where people have got to talk to someone completely different and a new idea um, has emerged. We've also, I haven't touched on this a lot, but we have put quite a lot of effort into building our community's knowledge about Te Māori and also worked very closely with the Federation of Māori Authorities and supported for a while for them to have their own chief advisor, Innovation and Research, to build their capacity as well. So it's not just about building our own internal capacity, it's also about building 
the capacity. I mean, you, you've got to imagine that, you know, having a bunch of um, physical scientists and engineers, there's not a lot of interaction with our Indigenous people in their day-to-day -day research life because they're not necessarily working in the environment or health where there's a lot of Māori who do work in that area. So we've been working quite closely on this. And in actual fact, we're just about to go as part of a delegation um, over to Australia. We've doing, been visiting and talking with CSIRO about their um, capability in, in the Indigenous space in Australia as well. So we're about to go in the first week of July and have some joint meetings with them um, in Australia. So some very exciting international work going on, talking about building international social capital. Okay, I'm nearly finished now. This is um, the other thing that we have, which is a bit different, and this is the team that I actually led, is that one of our projects is actually an innovation team who are studying what we're doing, if you like. So we're so the researchers and all of our new processes and all we're doing with our community is all data for them. And so we have they have um, quite a few papers coming out. Um, also, uh, a, a very shortly, a, a new insights report. So we're, we're, we've got, we're trying to capture a lot of this as we go and put it into, um, into an innovation lens. So some very interesting work um, coming out from, from them as well, which you can find on our website if you're interested. So just to finish, so this is us with a glance. Um, that's our dem demography. Um, we've worked very hard to get more emerging researchers into our field because there's not a lot of opportunities sometimes for postdocs particularly. Um, also encouraging Māori and, and women. For example, in our last seed round, um, we offered a, a proposal development grant so that you could go and spend it, um, not very much, up to $3,000, but you could go and spend it on a babysitter if you needed to, to help you get your proposal in. So it's trying to think about how do you, we remove some of those barriers to these, these more um, sometimes peripheral groups who are not deeply engaged in our sort of area. Uh, so there we go. So we've had, um, you know, a huge attendance at our um, various capacity development um, offerings. You can see some of the, the um, things that we've done up there on, on the, on the right-hand side. And one of the strongest things that come through, has come through is the absolute openness and willingness um, of our community to learn a huge amount more about um, Te Ao Māori, the Māori world, um, and what sort of issues that, from a science point of view, a research point of view, um, a collaboration with um, Māori would, would benefit. So um, yes, it's been, a, it's been a fascinating ride so far and two more years to go. So thank you. And uh, Tristan, I'll uh, send it back to you. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, fascinating presentation. So what we'll do is Sally and I will have a discussion um, and explore some of these issues for a little while. Uh, and then we'll open up to questions from the rest of the audience to, to explore in a bit more depth as well. So if you do have a question, as you think of it, you can put it into the Zoom chat. Uh, or in fact, when we get to the question time, you can raise your hand um, and you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. If you want to put something in the chat and you don't want to unmute yourself, if you don't want to read it yourself, um, please let us know and I'll, I'll happily read it on your behalf. Um, that can be important if you're, uh, perhaps if your English language skills aren't so great or if you're in a, a noisy environment as well, we'd be quite happy to, to read it out on your behalf. So Sally, I wanted to, to explore a couple of the themes coming out of your 2011 paper. And, and the first one that, I, that really struck me as being a bit surprising when I first read it was the role of leadership in forming uh, various aspects of social capital. Because I think the, the traditional view is that leadership is all important. And if we look at something like the way in which emergent communities form, we see leadership as being really crucial in shaping the direction in which social capital develops um, in those initial stages of, of social capital development. But the impression I got from, from your paper was that leadership perhaps isn't quite so important and perhaps the mission or the purpose um, is actually also or perhaps more important. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. Okay. Um... Yes, I've probably got several thoughts on that. I mean, I think um, I think leadership probably is important, but it's probably also really hard to measure or to assess the impact leadership directly has. And I think within the McDermott Institute, um, the thing about the leader was that he was hugely highly regarded, but he really did embody the, the goals and the sort of the values of the Institute. So I think it's more how the leader works in that space to build the community's um, alignment. Because one of the things that also was in that paper was that it's not a case of people just knowing that there are these organizational values, 
um, but also do you actually align with them? Do you believe in them? And I think if the leader is walking the talk on some of those sorts of things, then it's really hard to distinguish perhaps between what's more important, the goals and the values or, or the leader themselves. I think it's, it's very closely intertwined. Of course, in some of these institutes as well, you've got quite distributed leadership as well, which is, and, you know, so it can be quite diffuse. If you've got, you know, like, for example, inside SIFTI, we've got 10 people and, and we're all as important to the leadership of this program. It's, it's the, the community aren't seeing me all the time. They're often seeing other people in the leadership team. So it's actually, if the leadership team gets that purpose and we work independently, I think that's also been quite important. And one of the things I took from the article was that some individuals may take a, a mission statement and, and, a, and the idea of mission purpose, they may read that and they may immediately align with it, they may feel very strongly about it, and, and that may immediately set a lot of norms, uh, behavioural expectations, and perhaps even sense of identity just from that initial doc, even from a document. But for other people, they may not quite align with it or they might not quite agree or, or feel the same sort of mission and purpose. And therefore, I would imagine that there, there wouldn't be the same sorts of behavioral expectations that might therefore develop. And perhaps that's where leadership comes in is, is from that initial point, different people may have different uh, social capital effectively, but leadership may then help to shape the way things change over time. Would that be accurate, do you think? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, nobody's going to come into these sorts of um, organisations without some history. And I suspect, you know, a lot of researchers, you get a lot of cynical people when they first see a mission statement and things like that. So, you know, so I think it's really where, you know, does everything else align with, with that is, I think, is really important. I'm, I'm no leadership scholar, but it's my observation is that, you know, it's, it's, you know, if, if you're running an organization that's got innovation in the title or something like that, you know, do you really walk the talk? You know, for example, we, we do try and talk about the fact that, um, you know, failure is part of success and therefore we're not going to, uh, we want you to take risks and, and we'll tolerate that. And that's really hard often for, for traditional research organizations to do. Um, they don't want to hit the front page of the newspaper too often. But one of the things I, I and talking about distance again, and I know I'm being slightly tangential here, but one of the things that interests me is, is the role of um, slightly peripheral organizations to be able to do these sorts of experiments in, in the sort of the mission led area, because we've been sort of delegated the opportunity, if you like, to experiment in a way that a central government organization can't do. And uh, so do you take hold of that and really run with it? And then I think, yes, you know, I mean, I mean it, it sometimes it can, SIFTI can sound a bit like a cult. I, I joke that you can check out, but you can never leave. So, um, you know, from a capacity development point of view, we're, we're going to be interested in what you do afterwards. So, um, you know, and so there's some of those sorts of, do, do a lot of the things align. In terms of, you know, you, I know you were interested at one stage in how, how do you think about you know, almost sort of sanctions and what have you. Well, I mean, if you're talking about tolerating failure and risk and what have you, well then, you know, it's not about sanctions, it's about being open and flexible to allow change. And so it's about all of these things. I mean, I'm not sure that we've done a lot of that consciously, but just when you start talking about it from a social capital lens, um, it's very much about, you know, particularly that, that cognitive social capital when you're running a virtual organization, I think is probably one of the most important aspects. Yeah, and the interesting thing about sanctions, of course, is that sanctions can be both positive and negative. So, you know, we can, and, and they're also normative, the way in which an organisation or a group of people sanctions is normative in itself. And so if there is that process of um, pos perhaps even positively sanctioning, which sounds like a bit of a contradiction, but identifying, reacting positively to failure as it being about taking risks and, and potentially progressing things, then, then that helps to shape the norms. But another thing you also just, just mentioned is about the alignment of all of these signals about norm development. And I think that's that's really key. And, and um, if you have that distributed leadership kind of approach where there's multiple leaders, if, if there isn't alignment between all of those different leaders and the signals therefore become mixed and muddled, then I imagine you'd end up with um, norms not developing in the, this kind of way that you'd want them to be. Well, I think also um, perhaps like reflecting on what's happened in the last couple of years, I mean, our leadership team had been meeting by Zoom for years before the pandemic came. So I think, and we met face-to-face -face at least quarterly anyway. So we were quite a strong unit before this has happened. But what we have noticed with some of our teams is actually almost that 
that relational capital that you build from meeting face to face has definitely waned. So we've seen the cohesion in some of our teams and also I suspect the lack of the fact that we haven't been able to run an all of research workshop for two years, I think has really had quite an impact. I don't think probably if we went and tried to measure belonging at the moment, it would be ne not nearly as strong as it would have been in the community a couple of years ago. So I think there, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we should all go to virtual organizations, absolutely not to not, not at all. I, I, we really do understand the role of at least refreshing things, Mario would say, kanohi kete kanohi, you know, a couple of times a year face to face has been really important. So um, yeah, so from that point of view, those so, so I think we did manage to establish the norms quite early on. And now we're probably going to have to re-establish them a bit again, especially as some of the community has changed a bit in those two years as well. I will just go back into the sanctions thing, but I will, I will mention one thing in terms of alignment of signals. We actually have stopped some projects that weren't aligned with what we were doing. And I think that's extremely rare in a research system as well. So that's also walking the talk in terms of, right, if you're not, if you're not doing what we want you to do in terms of aligning what you're doing to, for, to help us you know, achieve our mission, then we will stop your funding. And we did. And there was a bit of an uproar. <laughs> but um, you know, I think actually people took notice that we will do that. And there was another, another project where we didn't, weren't getting any reporting. And then all of a sudden they, they came back to ask for some, um, to use some money that they hadn't spent. And we didn't even know they hadn't spent the money. So, you know, so we actually went in and did an audit. Now again, how often does that happen, right? So it's also about some of those things when things aren't going well, not just about being flexible, being flexible when, when there is a real reason for something happening, but then obviously these, these particular groups hadn't bought into our norms. They just thought that, that we were just another source of money. And I'm sorry, we weren't quite that. Yeah, and I think that's really powerful and important because um, it's not so much really about what we say, but it's actually about how the things that we do and we say are interpreted by people that it ends up being the most important. So where we get those inconsistencies somewhere in the signals, it can really undermine the overall development of, of strong norms. Um, and it might be something as simple as, well, you said that the money was going to be going towards this purpose, but you didn't bother following up on it. And the way that's interpreted then can really undermine the overall norm that you're trying to develop. So I think it's an interesting point. So one of the other things that you, that came out of, of the paper, well, talking about the same thing is, is that a diverse range of social capital formation processes contribute to the extent of, of member identification. And I think we've been talking around this issue already, that it's not just one thing. You can't just put all your hopes on, on one thing uh, and hope that it produces the, the kind of result that you want. And, and perhaps this speaks to the multi-dimensional nature of social capital, that you, you can't just focus on one. You know, there, there's multiples. Leadership is important. The mission is important. The way norms are developed are important. Um, so how do we get this right? Because it seems like there's many different ways we might go about developing social capital, um, but we, and we can't do just one. We know we need to do many. So how do we, how do we see what the things are that we need to do? Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, that original paper covered a whole range of things that, that the, the McDiamond Institute did, particularly around um, different types of communication, um, about the different types of, they had lots of video seminars to try and keep people connected so that they could see each other, um, sort of feel like they were part of a community. Yeah, totally, I, I, and that's, that's been really top of mind for me. Um, you know, a lot of people put great store in a sort of a once a year conference and them, sometimes that works. I think the thing is understanding the diversity of the audience you've got in there. So who are you trying to create social capital with and for? There's some of those people in the McDiamond Institute just absolutely, you know, just relish the idea of being part of this institute. It, it probably wouldn't matter what you'd done, they felt like they belong. Others really needed a lot more encouragement or were sometimes skeptical. They would, you know, really notice who was being profiled and who wasn't. So um, I'm being very careful to work with our comms people to make sure that the, the stories that we put up, I'd show the diversity of, of our group and try and, you know, try and profile as many different types of things that are going on as, as possible. So yes, yeah, so I think it's it's sort of it's that relational leadership style thing again, which is another thing that we do quite a lot of training and um, you know it's putting yourself in the other people's shoes and thinking what's going to work for them to increase that social capital. 
Yeah, and I think that came out of the paper as well, that the role of internal communications can be really, really important. You know, we, we do tend to think that social capital is built through face-to-face -face interactions that are that bi-directional two-way forms of communication, but that can also really strong uh, messages can also come from a newsletter, which is clearly a one-way form of communication, but it, it seemed in, in the paper, it seemed like that was identified as being really quite an important way to build social capital. Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I think I used the phrase, it's, it's internal marketing, which is, you know, is equally important for, especially when you've got distributed community, because, you know, they're not stakeholders, there's not an internal boundary and an external boundary, you've got lots of different organisational boundaries, because a lot of these people worked in different institutes, worked in different organisations, you know, so they potentially could have a sense of belonging to about three or four different types of organisations. So how do you work to make sure they're conscious of that belonging to your institute, I think is quite important. Yeah, and sometimes these sorts of newsletters, they feel like it's an awful lot of work to put together and, and time to write it and it goes out and no one seems to take any notice of it, perhaps might be some of the, the preconceived ideas people have. But I think um, when you really think about it in the way that you just described it, it, it becomes really vital and really important for, for developing those sorts of shared narratives and, and shared language and, and shared understanding, sense of purpose, like all of these really important, particularly cognitive aspects of social capital. Uh, really, really important. So also talking about the assumption often is that um, technologies are really great for enhancing in-person relationships, you know, so in-person relationships are vital, technologies can enhance and supplement and support those. And it seems to be that with the current sorts of technologies we have, that that's the case. You know, you mentioned that for, so for safety, that um, those in-person gatherings that you were having on a regular basis before the pandemic really stitched things together and the virtual technologies then just supplemented that and helped to maintain those relationships. But now without it during the pandemic, things might have deteriorated somewhat. So the question then is about technology. I, can you see ways that technologies might develop in future that could enhance or perhaps even replace the face-to-face -face? or can we use the current technologies better than we currently do? All right, have I got a research project for you? <laughs> so actually, one of, one of our projects that we're actually funding um, is a project called Atia, which is a Maori word for the space in the front of the meeting house on the marae where everybody gets together for their hui, you know, have you, and they often wear a lot of the the um, korero and the whakaro is done you know in, in the space and so we've got a project based at Waikato University but again spread across the country and, and using a marae in the South Island as a sort of a, as, as an exemplar um, where they're developing um, it's sort of like augmented virtual reality but you actually can interact with people in the space um, you know I, I don't understand the technology I probably need to get Bruce or Stephen who I can see <laughs> to speak more about it but they're doing this amazing stuff where you can actually almost like, it's a bit like Star, you know, in Star Trek, you can actually almost interact with each other virtually. And they're going to try, they're going to trial this alongside other different types of, you know, the traditional Zoom technology and what have you, um, to think about how they could run um, fire and that. So that how, did they, how can you run those sorts of, um, those discussion times and things like that when you've got distant people. There's a lot of Māori, for example, who live in Australia, you know, who are a bit disconnected. So at the moment, the, the proof that they've done at the moment has been more a little bit more static than that. The proof they've done so far is around um, building a, 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 a virtual model of this marae down south um, using actually just phone technology, so not having to hire a very expensive piece of tech. Um, and then also um, capturing some of the um, komatoa talking about the history. Of, of, of the Mariah and what have you, so that people can get engaged with this um, internationally. Now, that, that's not the only project it's doing, but the, te the technical challenges have been quite strong in some of these. And I know that there's lots of other sort of um, projects that are doing something similar, but it's just, you know, it, who knows where technology is going to go? Zoom is not going to do it. Um, but so, how do you make it feel like you're in a room and, and you, you can almost feel in touch? people, you know, in a meeting, but virtually. Um, it's, I think that'll be the next 10 years. I would, wouldn't be surprised if we'll be able to do that very soon. Um, yeah. I'm a bit of a technological optimist, so, um, you know. Yeah, and, and so am I, and that project sounds really exciting and something that's perhaps badly needed. And the way I often think about this is that Zoom existed before the pandemic and it was available to rapidly roll out and use, and so it, it's what we've used. Um, but it's a pretty poor fit for what we actually really want it to achieve. 
And I, I think an understanding of different social spaces really highlights what's missing perhaps from the use of Zoom, because in an in-person environment, you have a variety of different social spaces from public through to semi-public to semi-private and, and private spaces where you, you can have all different types of interactions where with zoom it's it's public or it's private you know a group meeting is public whereas a one-on-one -on -one meeting is private and there's really nothing in between and so i think like an understanding of that perhaps highlights what's missing and therefore where technology needs to focus the effort perhaps to try to create these kinds of different social spaces yeah sure and i think you know it's also very you know zoom is very rectangular you know, so, um, but I think actually one of the other things that is a, sort of a sort of a, a a bit of an issue that needs to be worked on and aligned with that, and it's actually happening inside this Artia project too, is that um, um, you also have to think about the data governance issues around that as well. Like, so, so this project is actually looking at what are the layers that you need to be thought thinking about about who should be able to have access to what sort of data levels of data. So there's a lot. There's a lot of complication that tech itself is not going to solve, but we also need a lot of those other um, sort of research, if you like, or understanding about what's appropriate as much as what's possible, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And as things like this, this conversation now, you could get into the into Zoom chat in a private message and send it, but is it actually private? And who will actually eventually have access to it? And are these things stored on servers? And can other people access them, them down the line? And so, there's a, yeah, you're right. There's a whole lot of issues around that that we'd need to explore in a bit more detail. So I think we're, our conversation is obviously fascinating and, we've, and we could probably go for a very long time, but I wanna open it up to questions from other people um, in the audience. So as I mentioned before, if you have a question, you can raise your hand within Zoom. You just go to the reactions button down the bottom and you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to your question. Uh, or you can post something in the chat and if you don't wanna read it out yourself for any reason, just let us know and we'll be happy to read it out uh, on your behalf. Um, so, Marion, should we just go to the chat first to see if there's anything? Um, Julian, I see you raised your hand, but should we have a look at the chat first? Is there anything? Uh, yeah, Julian had a question, and uh, there's an invasion of the Cornishes this morning. Oh, great. <laughs> let's let's start with Julian. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that was a really fascinating presentation, Sally. I really enjoyed it. I'm a, a recently appointed postdoc at CSIRA, so I'm really excited to see that you're going to come over and uh discuss how we can interact with our first nations people and with our research i've just spent most of this week actually at a transdisciplinary uh research forum um here in brisbane and we were talking a lot about some of this kind of crossovers between transdisciplinary research and social capital without even kind of really realizing that that's what we were doing until um I saw your presentation. So we have, um, I've noticed some overlaps like shared values uh, and um, this idea of trust and needing to have those essential elements in order to build social capital and also be able to do transdisciplinary research. And the program that I'm in at CSIRO is very transdisciplinary. And as a social scientist, I'm seeing that there's some challenges within the team and the program more broadly about how we speak the same language and understand each other's research priorities and goals in order to get to the ultimate uh, the end point that we're, we're all desiring to be at but you know it's those micro steps and those micro interactions that we have that are challenging when you're talking to like an ecologist or a biologist or you know a robotics person <laughs> it's really challenging to uh explain and validate your own perspective but also trust that they know what they're talking about and then know how to integrate and talk to each other and and build a, a really exciting research program together. So I was wondering what your perspectives are in how we can use perhaps social capital as a way to overcome some of those challenges in transdisciplinary research. Thank you. 
Actually, my, my initial reaction is not necessarily just the social capital, sorry. I mean, it's actually been a while since I've looked at the social capital literature, so you guys probably know far more about it than I do. But one of the things that I glossed over was the fact that sometimes those mission design processes don't always work. So we had one project that it took us three times before we actually managed to get something that looked like a team together. Part of that was identifying the right leadership, talking about leadership again. But also what we did in the end for the third time, which actually um, the rest of you might be really interested in, was we um, tried out a process. Well, it's, 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 yes, it is a really a process, which is called um, CK theory. So C as in concept and K as in knowledge. And so it's a process, um, quite a structured process, which was actually being led by a woman from RMIT, although she's now gone back to, um, to Europe, um, where you, you oscillate between the concept you're trying to work on and the knowledge bases of the people in the room. So it's a sort of a, it's a really interesting, quite structured, as I say, process, and we, that we actually managed to take it online because we had to then do it um, during the pandemic to get this project up and running. Um, so yeah, so you might be really interested in that as a way of thinking about transdisciplinary research. It's about building those shared norms, that shared language, all that sort of social capital ideas, but doing it in quite a structured way so that um, it's not serendipitous, if you like, which is what often happens. You just sort of put people in a room and hope it's going to work. So yeah, so if anybody's interested in that, I think it comes out of um, Paris. It's, a, it's a, um, from, might even be from the Ecole de Mine, I'm not sure, but so if you, feel free to email me if you can't find the uh, contact uh, and I'll, I'll um, make sure I can put you in touch with the, the, well, the person who did it for us because she's really great. Certainly a lot, of, a lot of the patterns of interaction that we end up having are quite normative as well. So if we can establish norms uh, of interaction where it's okay to ask what something means or um, and also for people to be more consciously aware that the, the language that they use may not be understood by the other people they're interacting with and, and then change the norms of how we interact and the expectations that people have around that. And quite often being very um, purposeful about it can be really helpful because it, it puts it out there for everybody to understand that it's okay to not know what something means if, in, across these different disciplines. It's okay, therefore, to ask what it means. Uh, as well as, of course, the, the, the people who are presenting the, the information to, to think about what other people might understand and not um, to use language that perhaps is a little bit more accessible. Yeah, no, I just I might go back to your leadership um, question again, too, on that, because one of the things I did gloss over a bit is how do we form the team from this mission design, co-design process, right? And, and actually, that's the bit of alchemy, if you like, in our process, and that what we tend to do, and, and, and from a social capital lens, it makes a huge, huge amount of sense, is that we look how people are interacting in the room. So we have members of our leadership team in the room, obviously, as well. And we watch about who is displaying the sort of, who, who gets what we're trying to do? Who gets the fact that we're trying to build a best team from, from people in the room and possibly some others? And who gets that we want this to be really collaborative and not just, not just pushing your own project? And so it's actually identifying potential leaders. We usually identify three or four. And, and then get them to work together is actually one of the steps that I think is it's hardest to codify, if you like, seeing who understands. And that's a real social capital lens. Who gets the idea about how do you build a team? Yeah. So I mean, interestingly, was the leadership explicitly aware of social capital and explicitly trying to build social capital? Were they using that term or was it being happen, happening more intuitively? No, I think it's probably intuitively. I mean, I, I, I'm embedded in it also, also, also on my leadership team, so it's it's part of our framing. Um, we've, we've got the capacity model was where we were very conscious about it, so that underpinned everything we do. But if you're talking about building relational capacity or, or human capacity, then or, and building best teams and things, just structural, you know, network type um, social capital, then it's inherent. And I think it's where. Sometimes there's so many in the social sciences, there are so many of these ideas like that, that framework on proximity that actually overlap. And I don't think that really matters. It's just, it's, it's a, you know, we're all trying to do things. This is social capital, if you like, gives us one language to talk about this, but there, there are potentially others as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we intuitively do a lot of it anyway, even if we're not particularly aware of specific concepts or ideas, I think we still end up doing a lot of this because it makes sense because we are social and, and we know these things are important. Um, I guess I was wondering, the dimensional approach, I think it provides a bit of a framework for understanding these, these kinds of issues. But to me, there's a lot of things that are missed that you don't readily identify by, by thinking about the, the three dimensions of social capital. So 
Do you think there is a way to systematically and purposefully understand these kinds of issues? Like is social capital the lens or is it actually that plus other things? Well, well I think it's, it's a lens and I, I prefer to bring several lenses um, to things at, at, at one time if that's the sort of appropriate way of saying it. So um, I think for me, putting it in an academic hat, you know, using some of these frameworks is about what do you learn from it? Not, not so much what, what insight, what further insight can it give you rather than can we apply it rigorously and measure all these things? I mean, obviously what you, what you measure, you manage, but you know, it's, it's for me, it's uh, well, actually, I, if you're looking at a framework and you think, actually, I hadn't really thought about that aspect of um, social, um, cognitive social capital, maybe how can I consciously think about that or, or, um, or actually bringing two frameworks together all right, so I, I don't know if, I presume, so in management, um, the Happy at Goshal's article from 1998 is probably the sort of baseline um, social capital article. And of course, they've got, there's more in there than just the three aspects of social capital. There's also a whole lot of other things about, you know, closure and time and interaction and those sorts of things. So it's also about how do you build something that is useful for, for and, and going to help you advance what you're doing, I think, more than just capturing what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And in my presentation a couple of weeks ago, talking about the limits of social capital, I think I identified a whole range of, of, of uh, issues that are clearly really important that wouldn't normally come up in that dimensional approach. Um, but having said that, of course, the dimension approach is very, very helpful for understanding a range of issues. It just doesn't cover everything. So I think you make a good point about um, using it to understand some things and then finding other things as well that can also be helpful. Um, so going back to the chat, um, Mike, you had a question earlier. Did you want to raise that? Sorry, I didn't unmute. Sally answered my question in two or three uh, during the course of the presentation. And she's free, I mean, welcome to expound upon it or move on to another question. I, I wanted to know about check-ins. Uh, that initially in describing the the mission and everything you you spoke uh, in a lot of task orientation or that's how it sounded to me and so I wanted to know you know did uh, and you you alluded to team building and mentoring and a um, couple of other things so you addressed it but if you want to say anything else by all means yeah, I think task maybe, I have, I have a real process lens on a lot of what I do. So maybe not task, but sort of how, to, how, can, we, how can we develop new processes that work to, to, to actually dis, almost disrupt a little bit how we normally do stuff. So I do talk a lot about the fact that we're, we're innovating the innovation processes, if you like. Um, we do, we do um, have um, six monthly reporting um, and annual reporting to MB. And so we do a lot of retrospective looking at what's happening and what's doing. But I think what's more important is the, the touch points between our leadership team. Every project has a theme leader, or if not two, assigned to it because the projects that have got a strong vision mātauranga aspect also have a, a Māori theme leader that checks in on them as well. So, so the touch, so there's sort of a, 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 a relational touch point there as, as well as that structural annual reporting sort of uh, and, and six monthly reporting type touchstone. Is that the sort of thing you were interested in? It is. I, for example, I'm currently involved in a yoga social emotional learning uh, training for, for instructors and they do check-ins. Uh, we also use Zoom and they'll do five or six check-ins during an hour with with all of the 100 150 participants and uh, just say two words it or two words into the chat as to how that exercise or or this meditation has has found you and they'll do it in in creative ways like give a weather report on how your day has been you know sunny and breezy rainy and cloudy you know that kind of thing so that that seems perhaps to many workplaces like, uh, okay, we're getting away from why we're here, but really isn't either. Yeah, well, I, I think that the sort of the, the chickens that we do, I think are really important in some of our institutions because um, there's not a lot of that, you know, I don't know about universities around the world, but I know the Australian and New Zealand universities, you know, there's, there's actually not a lot of management, you know, personnel management really goes on, not, not in a really constructive social capital way. 
Um, and so I think that's sort of been quite different that, that sort of somebody, as I say, seeing it, showing interest in what you're doing is incredibly powerful. And so I guess that's sort of the equivalent. It's someone taking notice of you in, in a large community. And I just wanted to ask if, you know, that had been part of, uh, of your work. Well, it definitely is. I mean, this, this association between somebody from the leadership team and the projects is, is it's um, generic. It's hundred percent across all of our projects. And it's, it's how we, it's how you really keep in touch. I don't actually think the annual reporting necessarily is going to surface sometimes the issues that you might want to be able to address. And so it's that the human human contact, I think, in terms of sometimes sorting things with which have got nothing to do with the research, um, particularly through COVID, of course, has been, so we've actually run quite a lot of things around resilience and, you know, well-being and things as capacity development um, in the last year as well as, as the traditional, you know, how do you talk to a stakeholder type project. Thank you. Also coming out of your 2011 paper, the, the role of administration in also shaping the way, the shaping the social capital of the organization, I think to me that was surprisingly important. Uh, you kind of think about, well, let's get the researchers together, you know, let's get the people doing the work together. But in fact, the ways in which the administration interacted with those researchers was also really important. Yeah, I mean, the program office I have, um, and Reese Moore's here, it runs it. I mean, you know, as an academic, I have never had a team of 10 people working for me to help me do what I do. So it just is so empowering to have that capability. And so often some of those touchstones is actually between our office and the research office and the institution, as much as you know, to facilitate things, to facilitate changes in contract, to facilitate some new resources or some, you know, anything that seems to be a bit of a blockage. So, you know, having, um, and they buy, they bought into the mission just as much as, as we have, and probably more so actually, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's an exciting team to work with and they're, they're just wonderful. So another question coming up in the chat uh, from Tara was interested in how it got funded and started. I know you talked a little bit about that, but um, I'm not sure if you're involved from the very beginning, but like, what would it have been like from day one to try and set this up? Well, I, I was involved fairly early on. So, I mean, the thing is, again, each of the 11 National Science Challenges is slightly different. So the, the funding and the mission and their names was sort of already determined. And then it was a case of sort of the willing getting together and trying to decide what a program might look like. So um, I wasn't running it, but I went to some of the sandboxes and what they called sandboxes, which were sort of facilitated workshops of the researchers, sometimes with industry and Māori in the room as well, trying to figure out, okay, how do we put a program together? Now, for our one, it started off being very technical. Um, and so actually it was that we had another iteration where we also then thought about, okay, what do we mean by capacity? And that's where I had much more of a stronger role, the, the innovation team that were there. So we went from being... I think we were something like spearhead five at that stage and only four people. And so we went to being spearhead one and about eight people because the feedback was, this is probably one of the most important parts of this whole National Science Challenge is this innovation team. So, um, so yeah, so it's, and how did we get funded? Well, the funding was already determined. Um, we were all hosted in, in some sort of organization for the New Zealanders um, hosted in, uh, we're hosted in Callaghan Innovation. Um, so the other ones are hosted in either Crown Research Institutes or, or universities, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and so the funding then just, it's, we have a budget and it just comes through like that. And so, so we don't like to see ourselves as just a funder though, because um, otherwise there's no point in us existing. We could just dish the money straight out from the government. So, um, we, so, that's, so we really, from quite early on, I've also written a little bit about um, the notion of additionality. So what are you doing that's over and above what would have happened if you didn't exist? And so that's where um, that framing around, and particularly behavioral additionality. So what are you doing to change behaviors? Um, so that is going to hopefully going to be our legacy in the longer term, in terms of what sticks once we stop as an, as an organization. You know, what behaviors that we've tried to instill will continue into new partnerships and new relations and new collaborations. So that's, that's the legacy that, that, that the leadership team are really hoping we'll see. And it must have been the same thing for the Australian CRCs, the Corporate Research Centres, I think that's that they stood for, because they ran for six years and they would get funding and some of them would be renewed for a further six years. But then I think they were concerned about the same sorts of issues, that their funding would come to an end and what would be the legacy, you know, what would change moving forward? 
and putting a social capital lens on that, this is the one the thing I really hate about this sort of process, right? Because we've put a huge emphasis, particularly in Te Amari, on building relationships, but then the funding stops. And so it's not surprising that a lot of stakeholders get very cynical about any sorts of attempt to collaborate because you just you just slip straight back into transactional mode. It's not about that relationship. It's about where the funding's coming from. So yeah, the cooperative research centers in Australia, um, the centers of research excellence like the McDiamond Institute are also like that. They, so, but we're not even getting the chance to be refunded. We're just being stopped. I mean, I should say that there is a large review happening in New Zealand of the whole innovation system at the moment anyway. So it's not surprising. They're just really trying to think we're almost going back a little bit to ground zero and think, what should we be doing? So I've, and, and we've been really pushing for the fact that, um, you know, that there needs to be a rebalancing towards um, not just competitive funding, but some more mission led type. If it's not us, it's, it's not national science challenges. We do also have these things called platforms, which is sort of think, seems to be the language that's been used in New Zealand quite a bit now for these sorts of um, more collaborative platforms that you can you can work from. So, so we shall see. Um, I, I'm optimistic as usual that something will last past when Sufti finishes um, and that we will, as I say, have some sort of legacy. I wonder if our Australian colleagues are aware of any work that might have been done in relation to the CRCs, because I, I was involved in quite a lot of them in a very limited very capacity. And I, I know there was a lot of discussion about the what would happen after the CRC finished. Um, so I wonder if any of the Australians know anything about some findings from that. Uh, if you do know anything, it'd be interesting to share that perhaps with us. Um, Tara, did you want to expand any further on, on those ideas? Uh, no, it's all good. Thank you. I'm just really, I'm working on a project at the moment and I do a lot of regional impact programs. And I think that's one that's a huge issue in terms of long-term impact. So I really like your concept, Sally, around additional behavioural, uh, sorry, additionality. And, um, you know, a lot of funders in Australia, it's just about a tick and flick. There's no impact made. And I think that, you know, what you said is really interesting. And I think we need to learn how to do more of that in Australia. So thank you. Well, I think so we've also got a, a bit more of a, a broader impact framework too, because we're now actually, with our last two years, impact is the word, like impact and legacy. So, for example, we've, we've just um, done our last big investment around what we're calling ending, ending with impact projects. Yeah. So, so what, we, so what we said was we're not going to just smear the money across the projects we've got and let you keep going. We want you to pick something that if we put some extra investment in, it would really accelerate towards impact. But impact isn't just for us. I think we've got about an eight dimensions on our impact notion. So we've obviously got for our capacities. So we've got the you know, technical, relational, social um, and human. We've got um, behavioral change of our partners. We've got um, environmental, cultural, social, as well as commercial. So, so we think of impact quite broadly um, with some of our, you know, that RTIP project, for example, that impact is going to be more about connecting Fano back to their roots than it is mm -hmm. commercial implementation. So impact, I think that's one of the things that, you know, evaluation of any sort of impacts is missing a lot from a lot of our research systems. And so, and that drives behavior, right? So people don't worry about it. They say what they're going to do and never do it, <laughs> which is again, where that touchstone thing about checking in with what's happening and stopping projects um, is actually important signaling. Now, since somebody had their hand up, who could talk about the um, CRC? Uh, uh, Julian did. Oh, that was me. Yeah, no, I don't have a lot of information about that, sorry. Um, but I do know that some of them, it wasn't a hard end date. Well, the funding might have been a hard end date, but there was a transition plan for some of the CRCs to spin off into uh, a semi-commercialized uh, research programs. Um, so yeah, I don't have, I don't know about all of them, but I know that one of the mining ones, for example, um, has continued more or less. They've just sought funding from a private sector, which is, um, I suppose possible in, in the extractive sector um, at this time. So that's all I know. Yeah, and I recall that was quite often the focus for those CRCs was to, to look for a, a, a commercial endpoint, um, which perhaps isn't possible for a lot of the types of um, uh, research innovation uh, that Sally's talking about in New Zealand. A uh, question came up in the in the chat from Sandra. Um, one of Sandra's earlier comments was in relation to the power of proximity in the face-to-face -face communication because so much communication is non-verbal. 
And so that certainly gives us a hint for, for technology about how we might need to try to replicate some of that um, some of that nonverbal communication. But you also have another question, Sandra. Did you want to unmute yourself to ask that? Comment on that. Just I think yep. one of the things is technology is never going to be able to replicate the social situation, right? So the chat over a cup of tea or a glass of wine, you know, it, that's really difficult to do. I don't know, the virtual conferences have been really struggling with that as well. I mean, it's already, we, we could all sit here with our own glass of wine, but it's not quite the same. Um, so, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think one of the ways I think about it is that we, it's different because we know that the potential for physical interaction is is not there. You know, you can't reach out and put your hand on somebody's shoulder and everybody knows that. And so immediately the, the nature of the interaction is different, no matter how good technology becomes at communicating on those nonverbal signals, it's, it's always going to be different. Um, Sandra, did you... Yes, well, I have one question. Well, uh, several questions here. Do you think that the environment helped to build social capital? For example, the macro environment? I mean, of, of the science challenge? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the things that um, I would really like to capture a bit more of is the permissive nature of the policy that we were, so that the, the 11 National Science Challenges sit inside this policy. It's, it's um, I'm quite a fan of actually being quite ambiguous in communication because it's quite empowering. It means you can go away and do stuff. And I think in certain aspects, this policy was quite ambiguous. <coughs> it didn't tell us how to do anything. It just said, you know, here's your mission. You decide how you're gonna do it. We're gonna check in with you. Well, we have to approve, we approved the proposal. There was a mid point review as well. Um, and there was an international panel that did both of those. So, but basically it was quite, a, yeah, I'd say it was permissive. And I think if you get a policy that's permissive and allows experimentation within certain boundaries, that that really helps, um, does it build social capital? I think it enables the people who have been given the opportunity to really explore how do you, so, so we got given some things. We had to do best team collaboration. Well, I mean, there's social to capital for you straight in the face. What does that mean though? And how do you do it? has been up to each individual challenge to figure that out. And we've all done it quite differently. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, did it encourage informal relationships between members? Um, well, I think, did it encourage? I don't think the policy specifically did. I think how we've operated has. Um, yes. Since we have, we do the, the 11 science channels, um, challenges the directors meet as well so we meet formally with with the government and we also meet informally so to sort of just, just chat about what we're doing as well so there's a lot of sharing of ideas across the system across the challenge system as well which I think is that's something that you know we instigated ourselves so um, I think and that's because we all really wanted to make sure we succeeded in what we were doing Yes, I am saying because you need more proximity, right? More trust between the members. Yeah. And maybe the informal uh, relations could help you, you know, to build the social yeah. capital that you need. Okay, thank you very much, Sally. I think there's a lot of talk about trust, but I think don't forget the, the sort of the antecedent of trustworthiness, which I think is really important in this space. So how do you build that when you haven't got any social capital because it's, you need, you. It's sort of, it's almost like a, like a contagion, I hate to say that in COVID times, but you know, if you know somebody who knows somebody else, then you're more likely to trust that third person as well and things like that. So it's also about, you know, that the, the visible network as much as, as um, you know, the trust itself. Yeah, because it is interesting in, in social capital, we often think about norms and trust as being different things, whereas it's probably more useful to actually think about them as being the same. It's norms of trustworthiness, just like there's norms of a whole range of other different things as well. Thank Thanks, you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Sandra. Uh, so we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, if anybody else has any final questions or thoughts you'd like to share, feel free to uh, raise your hand or pop something in the chat. Oh, Marion, I know you've had a couple of comments and we didn't get to yours. We can't ignore yours. We've been, uh, I've been busy in the background, so sorry. Um, and most of the questions are answered, but I, I think with uh, Sandra's question, my interest goes back to this having a look at the mission co-design 
Um, and you mentioned that that's actually a French model that you uh, that you actually sort of followed. So we did it. We did that once. So just because in, we, we're in a particular area that we hadn't managed to get a team to form beforehand. <coughs> Excuse me. So no, normally we have a sort of facilitated. In fact, we had a really interesting natural experiment happened in that first year of COVID because we managed to get one mission co-designed a project set up purely face to face. Yeah. The one that was a mixture of face to face and virtual, um, with a with just a normal facilitator. And then we did this one with this using the CK theory notion, um, which is a particular framing of um, a mission co-design type thing. Yeah. So which is usually used inside organizations. I think this is the first time that the facilitator who did it for us had ever used it for forming a research team or such. Yeah, I, I think some of us would be interested to find out um, some more about that, Tristan. So. Yeah, okay, so... Because um, that fits with stakeholder involvement, open strategy, there's a whole lot of things that actually tie into that. Yeah, well, as so. I said, um, mm -hmm. Olga Kishninkski was the woman from RMIT who, who did this for us, and they actually also train trainers in it as well. So um, so I can probably connect with her. If you, you, you all hopefully have access to my email, I think, somewhere. So um, I'm pretty easy to find. LinkedIn? Been... LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> on LinkedIn? Yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Good, great. So, and I say I've been on the same place for over 30 years now, so same email. <laughs> so any, any final questions or, or thoughts you'd like to share? One last opportunity. Well, let, let's wrap up the session. Uh, thanks very much, Sally, for, for the presentation. It's been certainly a really fascinating discussion. We really appreciate the time and effort you've, you've put into it. Well, you're just lucky that um, you didn't give me three hours because I could have filled that too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm sure we could talk all day for certain. So next week, we, we our webinar next week is by Dr. Mason Matthews, who's going to be giving a presentation about how social capital is created and maintained to achieve development goals. And he's going to be presenting the, res the results of his uh, ethnographic research in the riverine area of Brazil, looking at how different types of social capital um, can help to achieve the development goals in that area. So that's on uh, Friday in um, Eastern time or on early on Saturday morning if you're in New Zealand and, and very early if you're in Australia. Hope you can join us for that one. Uh, the following week, we have a, an informal discussion group, which everyone is welcome to join as well, if you're interested. Okay, so we'll just uh, end the session there.